the title of this paper uh, is incredibly boring, but uh, I, I hope that, that you'll join my excitement because you know, really the, the idea here was uh, how we can start to instrument learning systems to support continuous improvement. Uh, so the summary here is that we created this AI-driven uh, uh, design modification that uh, increased student engagement. This online game, there's thousands of online players, and we use machine learning to drive design improvements. And then it spun out of control. So uh, I'm going to go into uh, my interest in design spaces. So uh, this, this is what gives us the ability to optimize uh, the, the learning systems. So during my PhD, I designed a lot of different games. Um, mostly math and cognitive skills, created a lot of different motivational frameworks around them. And um, there's a lot of decisions to make when you, when you make games. There's a lot of arbitrary decisions that you need to make. So, for instance, how you end a game, uh, you know, after three mistakes, the level's over, or, or two mistakes, or after 60 seconds, or three successes, or ten attempts, or after nine attempts, or two mistakes. It, there's, there's so many little arbitrary decisions. So, you, you know, you kind of do what feels right. But there is another way, right? And so design spaces are this great conceptual tool in design because it lets you see designs not at this one point solution, but as this range of possibility. So Stu Card had this design space of input devices. The point here is that any given design um, has design factors, which represent the space of variability. And the design space is just the multiplication of all those different design factors. So in this case, you've got these different dimensions uh, of input, whether it's you know, one-dimensional input, two-dimensional input, and whether you're using motion or position. What I do is I just took this as a, a Google uh, you know, Docs screenshot, because what I'll do is I'll have all these games, and we'll have all these different design factors, and we represent how things could vary. And then at the end of the day, you just choose one. But what we're trying to do here is we create this design space, we figure out some way to measure the outcomes, and then we choose the final design. And this lines up with Herb Simon's approach in, in, uh, to, towards design, which is that you're creating a lot of variations, and then you're evaluating them, and then you're choosing them. So the evaluation technique that we can use is like A-B testing, so online experimentation. Um, not for average revenue, but in our case, um, how long players play a particular game. And we get about uh, you know, 10,000 kids playing these, these games a day. Um, and so we've got the capacity to run thousands of experiments. But setting up each experiment, analyzing, and then acting upon it is, is hard. It takes a lot of time. And so the thought was, well, what if we could just automatically reconfigure uh, the games uh, based on this user data, this engagement data? So uh, Battleship Number Line is a game that was created because... 50% of 8th graders couldn't put three fractions uh, in the right order, which is kind of stunning. And so creating a game to help support number sense. Uh, and so we came up with these two different approaches. Sorry about the resolution here. Um, let's see whether this works. So you can hardly see it. Um, so what will happen here is you'll see this ship between a number line 0 to 1, and you type in a number, you try to blow it up, right? Or you're given a fraction, and you need to click on where you think a, a submarine is hiding. Okay, so just missed it. And so this, this is a really, really simple game, uh, but lots of, lots of kids play it. And it's got all these design factors. So whether you're typing or clicking, whether it's a ship or submarine, how big that target is. If it's a bigger target, it's easier to hit. Uh, how long the time limit is. What fractions we're presenting whether there's tick marks to scaffold your estimates, how we're uh, sequencing the fractions based on your mistakes. You can break all these up. There's these sort of parametric design factors, and then they produce these outcomes, these outcome measurements in terms of how long people play, uh, the mistakes that they make. And then there's these other sort of covariates, you know, the, the time of day, that sort of thing. But when you put together all the different design factors, um, there's 1.1 billion variations, right? And, and these things explode really, really quickly. Um, so you can't test everything. And so we, we need to use some theory to, to get into it. I presented this a couple of years ago. Um, this was a, a 2 by 9 by 8 by 6 by 4 by 4 factorial experiment. Um, 
with uh, about 70,000 players. We tested a bunch of those different design factors that I mentioned and had a pretest. And you come up with, with things like this. So these outcome factors, you've got the difficulty and the engagement. These are these different design factors, the items that are presented, the target size, the time limit, and then the, the context of, of the user. And you get to do these nice you know, 3D response surface graphs. But what I was interested in how, is how we could automate this, because we don't really care how bad the worst conditions are. We don't need precise measurement of the poorly performing conditions. We just want to find the best one. And so you know, we can trade off. We don't need the precision on the, the low performing ones. Um, and so that's where multi-arm bandits came in. So first problem, it's a really big design space. We want to efficiently explore it, and we want to automate it, because it's too hard to set up all these experiments. The other problem is that <laughs> it's related. We've got so many users, we don't have, um, we're not taking advantage of the experimental capacity. And the third problem is that we, we don't want to just throw a bunch of crap in front of users willy-nilly. We, we, we want to give them stuff that's probably the best. And so framed as a, as a question, how might we automate experimentation to systematically test a broader design space while minimizing the exposure of users to bad conditions? So this is, this is all of statistics comes from gambling. Um, and this is no exception. So here, you've got a row of slot machines. Some are looser than others. They've got a better payout. But you don't know which is which. And you're not there to do science. You're there to make money. You've got a stack of coins, and you need to figure out how to make the most money possible. And it's this really hard mathematical problem. You have to balance your exploration of different slot machines, and you get an uncertain reward. It's, it's not certain every time. You might win because it's a, a good machine, or it's random, right? And so interface design is similar in a way because you get this, this uncertain reward function. You don't know necessarily what's going to be better. Um, Something like 50% of the A-B tests that are run at Google by Google's designers don't produce any effect. Um, you know, and, and they wouldn't have run them if they didn't think that they'd be beneficial. So designers aren't often right about what's best. Uh, and so the specific approach that we took is this upper confidence bound uh, bandit. There's a bunch of different kinds, but this one was very easy to illustrate. So if you're familiar with a confidence interval, you know that a high confidence interval can mean that um, you've got a high mean or that uh, you don't have enough information. So for instance, if I've got these three designs and I'm deploying them, this really broad confidence interval could mean that I've got a high mean up in here, or it could mean that I just don't have enough information. Either way, if I'm trying to optimize, I should choose the one with the highest interval because it'll either allow me to collect more information and shrink the size of, of that, uh, that bound, or uh, it, it's likely to be the, the highest performing. Um, now, upper confidence bounds don't make assumptions about the underlying distribution of the data, like confidence limits, uh, where it assumes a normal distribution. But you don't need to worry about it too much. This is how it works. You basically uh, add up the mean of the condition. So in our case, uh, it was uh, normalized how many trials people played. And then this is the total number of pulls. So the total number of times you've deployed that particular arm of the slot machine. So in multi-arm bandit parlance, the arm is a condition that you're deploying. It's like a cell in an experimental design. Um, and so you're, you're dividing the total number of pulls by the total number of pulls uh, for that particular condition. And this tends to, so the more that you test this condition, the, it'll shrink the bound, OK? So the first hypothesis was that we could use multi-arm bandits to support UX optimization, uh, to automatically search through the design space. The second hypothesis was that we could reduce the cost to subjects. We don't want to expose students to designs that aren't effective. And so what we did is we, we put together a meta experiment. It was an experiment of experiments. So we compared random assignment to these two different varieties of, of multi-arm bandits, uh, upper confidence bound ban bandit and an upper confidence limit bandit. 
um, which is really just for illustration. People are much more familiar with upper confidence limits than chernoff holfding bounds. So that was really to illustrate. When we ran this uh, with about uh, 10,000 subjects, we found that the, our first hypothesis was confirmed. Both bandits were able to identify the highest performing uh, condition, the submarine, that was the biggest. I'll show you that in a second. Random assignment, of course, randomly distributed the, um, the experimental assignment. And so you can see, the, you can't see, but uh, this is the worst design, this little tiny ship, and this is the best design, it's this big submarine. Uh, the second hypothesis was around reducing cost to players. So what we find here is that both bandits produce total uh, overall engagement. So this is more, more estimates were made in the bandit conditions than were made in the random assignment conditions, even though they had the same number of players. Okay, so this showed that there was more overall engagement in the bandit conditions. So then we brought out this, this third hypothesis, that we could use bandits to reduce the cost to designers. Because after all, the, the point here was that running and analyzing and, and adjusting to experiments takes time. So if we could just automate that, it'd be great. So we introduced a ridiculously large, bad design. You can't see it very well, but this is an enormous submarine. And no one who looked at it, I mean, it's overlapping the panel there. I mean, it, it's just sort of ridiculous. So we wanted to see whether the bandits would recognize that this was a, a bad design and, and pull it out. Uh, so we ran another uh, meta experiment uh, across these different uh, ship sizes. And what was very surprising to us, um, well, first of all, what was surprising to us was how well this condition did. It was one of the, the you know, uh, it was maybe number two or three here. Um, and uh, so this, this makes us question, is this a bad design or is this a bad metric? We're trying to maximize the number of times that uh, players are participating. Uh, this is what the players are wanting. But we started getting calls from uh, BrainPop where we host the sites. They're like, what's going on? You've got a bug. Um, but this is what the kids wanted. So uh, there's, there's no real answer to that. But, but that's part of, there has to be a dialectic around our metrics, right? Because Amazon has to do this. You can't just optimize for short-term revenue. You've got to think about your brand image. You've got to think about all these other things. And so you, you, you always need to challenge your metrics. Um, in terms of the ability to reduce designer costs, it was definitely not confirmed. Not only did this bad design do well, just as a result of the metrics, but the most successful design, so this is random assignment, uh, measures of how long people play. The most the longest played was, was 70. And you know, you can say that 90 and 95 are, they're not overlapping, their confidence intervals so significantly different. Um, yet, the, the, uh, the two bandits, they chose 90 and 80. So 80 you could understand, but 90 didn't even work. And so the bandits didn't even work. And so we were struggling. We we're trying to understand why, why did this happen? So, a little bit complicated to under, understand, but bear with me here. So these are the different conditions, the different sizes of the submarines that are being deployed. So each dot is a, is a pull, is a deployment of that particular design. Uh, this is uh, the, the average number of trials that's played over time. Up there, you can see that's the random assignment because it's deploying all conditions equally all the time. These are the bandits, and you can see that they kind of choose one at some particular point. But if you notice in the average number of trials in the bandits, uh, I'm sorry, in the random assignment, there's seasonal variation. So this is during the course of the day. So kids tend to be more motivated um, earlier in the day, and then there's a drop off, and then it picks up later on. And so what seemed to happen was that when the bandits happened to be testing uh, this particular condition, it was in a peak. And so they just went with it and ran with it. And so a lot of the studies of this particular uh, type of bandit, the, the UCB1, are, are done in a, a, a not real world context. And so the thing that this taught me is that you've got to have randomization. So you can't do these, these sequential experiments. You can't just you know, trust the algorithm. 
if you, if you know nothing else about it, make sure that there's something that's being randomized. And there are alternative uh, banded algorithms, such as Thompson sampling, which probabilistically match um, uh, deployments to conditions that are most likely the best, but there's still a great deal of randomization. So poorly performing conditions can still be deployed. The other piece here is that we've got to keep humans in the loop. When we're running these automated design experiments, which I'd expect to increase significantly in the future, we've got to make sure that people are integrated into the process to follow along, uh, partially because the metrics that are being optimized for aren't necessarily correct, and there's got to be people who can, uh, can watch for that. In an ideal world, we're talking about a... Um, having a dialectic between the, the measurable data and the experience of designers where there's arguments taking place about what the data means and what the experience is. And this is, this is typically how you know, A-B tests are, 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 are run in industry where you're not just blindly choosing a particular condition. Um, but some of the implications that came out from this uh, is that if, if you're looking to optimize, you don't necessarily need to randomly assign. You can take advantage of a bandit. You don't need to perfectly measure your low-performing conditions. Uh, designers can increasingly uh, deliver a fuzzy design, so a range of, of, of um, parameters that would be suitable in a final design as opposed to a single choice, okay, and then let the system uh, self-configure. For policymakers, there's this really interesting aspect. So after the Facebook experiment, there's a whole lot of concern around the, the role of online experimentation and software products. We're probably going to have a similar situation in education at some point, which is going to be really sad because there's so much opportunity to drive forward learning science. And so if you've got a way that allows the most likelihood is that you're giving students the best performing design, it's a little bit more ethical. You know, it's not like you're going to end up in the control group where, you know, because this is what parents get concerned about. You, you'll run an experiment, you'll have a control group, and they're upset that their kid's in the control. They're like, well, we don't know if it's any, any better. Uh, but in this case, you can have some guarantees that you're getting what is, on the basis of the information that you have, the best design. Um, and then, in general, always to challenge the validity of, of the metrics and to keep humans in the loop. There's some future opportunities around how we best integrate uh, human oversight into algorithmic optimization. Don Norman's been talking a lot about uh, human technology teamwork. I think this is a, a great opportunity for that. Um, bandits and statistical claims. If you don't use randomized uh, assignment, can you stand on uh, the data coming from the bandits? That's something that, that needs to be validated. One thing that I'm really excited about is not just applying this to optimizing outcomes, but applying it to the development of theory. So the bandits that we used used each individual condition um, as an arm, as opposed to un having any understanding of the, the factors underneath it. And so there's got to be some way to uh, identify generalizability within the data, and uh, that would allow a double-nested loop um, that would support both AI-assisted design and scientific inquiry, where we can use these experiments to develop theory in addition to optimize. So uh, that's a great place to stop, and uh, I can take any questions. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, a Google Content Experiments uses uh, uses uh, multi arm bandits, the Thompson sampling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, we've got time for our second half, so just see who you are. I'm Joseph. Are you hearing Yes. That's right. Because it allows randomization to cycle on the page. One thing I'm, I guess, one thing I'm curious about, one is how we might start using advanced precisation 
but that's a mm -hmm. question. So more concretely, one thing I like about Thompson sampling and probability matching is that you can let these designers like find clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, you know, when I think about these fuzzy designs, I think that a designer might uh, put in their optimal, their assumed optimal, and then have a feedback loop that allows them to check and discuss around whether their optimal was in fact optimal or, or not. Um, and that could serve as a prior. So. Mm. Sort of to sort of keep up the exploration, mm. even when you think you could be exploiting. Um, and the, the ethics uh, question, because in a sense, given your model, um, that, that randomization says that sometimes you're going to intentionally choose in the interest of transparency something which, by your prior, is inferior uh, to, to give to somebody. So, have you thought about how to sort of adjust the tension? Like, for example, what about the poor person who's unlucky and keeps getting the the Right. Right. Yeah, I think that's a great question, actually. I, I love anything that tries to embed ethics into computational systems. I think that the point here is that um, what what we'd be looking for is something that's only testing uh, to test itself. And so the, the point is, is that if you're looking, um, you don't know whether things are the best unless you're testing them. Uh, and so I... I Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great question. I'd I'd really wonder whether there's a ethic a more ethical version of Thompson sampling uh, that would have some additional parameters. I'd be really interested in that. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, David. Mm -hmm.